All right, here we are for our third session and we're a small but mighty crew today. So hopefully from the archives of the depths of the DOE, someday someone might hear us talk about implementation of trauma responsive schools. And in any event, um, Lisa's brilliant and we always have a wonderful time talking. So never a wasted um, moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. And while you're doing that, I think we should give some recognition to Dave as the third member here for his- I do, you're right. <laughs> Just and, and you too, Cassie. Just so we all we all get um recognition for our brilliance today. A little bit of a shout out today. I love it. Okay, share screen. Oh, you have to let me share my screen or it's gonna be completely you today, Lisa. <laughs> I have some good examples if you're still here, Dave, of what teachers have done that literally when I got them were jaw dropping. I couldn't like, wow, I can't believe how effective they are at some of this. So Hopefully, again, I'll try to make sure that we get some of those um, in yeah. here. And somewhere, my beautiful cover slide disappeared. I remade it for us today and then got rid of it. So I want to talk about three primary things today. I want to talk about the trauma responsive framework, which is really the primary guiding model for the work that I do, not just with schools, but other providers as well. And then I'll talk about uh, trauma responsive school implementation. So what were the overall principles I selected, at least for the large five-year DOE project that I worked on, and why are those important guiding principles when we think about trauma responsive trans transformation in particular? And that'll lead us right into thinking about the whole world of what we could do to become trauma responsive. Um, and there are lots and lots of different rubrics or frameworks or assessments out there by lots of different people about how we um, assess the degree to which a school or organization is following those guiding principles and practices. But this is one way of thinking across a multi-tiered system of supports about what that might look like. And, and I would add, well, I'm certainly gonna talk about more general non-trauma specific things within that camp. My focus is definitely on those things that directly pertain to helping students deal with, with adversity, ACEs, et cetera. I've had an awesome couple of weeks with schools as we're ramping up here for the 2022-23 year, teaching them the trauma responsive framework with vignettes and then having them practice ways they can use this. And so I wanna introduce everybody first to what this model is and what folks have done with it to, to effectively intervene. And really the crux of the model is helping people make sense of behavior, be curious about student or family behavior or their own behavior, and then to, to make meaning of it all in really direct and explicit ways so that people can transcend those circumstances. And I'll come back to this general model a couple of different times for folks to look at. Again, I'm just trying to get that to move a little more, but it won't. Um, so I'll give us a first glance at this and then I'll add a couple of elements as, as we talk through this. And um, for those of you out there who are familiar with the fact that I spend most of my life doing child parent psychotherapy and training mental health clinicians, I will share that I adopted the model from one of the really magical interventions in child parent psychotherapy called the triangle of explanations. And, and Dave, you're a mental health clinician. You're going to probably recognize elements of this that are either explicitly or not a part of other therapeutic approaches. And I'm not here to make anybody a therapist. I do know the ways in which we respond to students can be therapeutic, regardless of whether we're a therapist or not. And so again, we'll talk through that. As you can see here, there are five main bubbles, as I would say, and I want everybody to note that what's in the very center of it in blue is reflective process. And if I'm a mental health clinician, if I'm a, a police officer, but certainly if I'm an educator, what we know about the brain tells us that reflection is what allows people to change from history and to, to make intentional choices about how they want to be, and in particular with other people. So educators are often familiar with reflective process in terms of um, analyzing their pedagogy and thinking about how they want to do it differently. With, with this form of reflective practice, our emphasis 
is really on emotional responses and relational um, elements and how those are impacting the teacher-student relationship in particular. And then um, at the very top, we always have to lead with a sense of safety. That's the number one principle in trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive or trauma-responsive approaches. So we know that safety through neurobiology, as we talked about in the first session, is absolutely key to, to learning. During session two, we talked about the vital role of relationships in mediating fear and transcending stress and adversity. But then also we talked about the important role of hope given the negative cognitive triad. And I'll mention that a little bit later. So we're leading in, in this way of both, as you can see, being, having a level of self-awareness, understanding who we are in relation to others so that we can truly see the students, the kids, the, you know, the families, our colleagues in front of us in ways that um, are overly shaded by our understanding of ourselves. And again, I'll come back to all of these. I just want to start folks thinking about this. And then experiences on the far right-hand side are all about the whole range of positive and negative experiences we have throughout our lifetime. But yes, in particular, those that we find traumatic or, or lingering in terms of ongoing experiences or stress. And make no mistake, I'm not encouraging anybody to be poking and prodding about every detail of somebody's past, but I am saying approaching it with curiosity is helpful. And so I talk about gentle, persistent curiosity. That's the darndest thing. I am so curious about what in your life story, everybody has a story, helps me understand what I'm seeing before me. And those are the things that you see at the very bottom. Now I'm calling them impacts in our normal world, if you will, you'd call them behaviors. And they're typically the target of our behavior plans in many ways. And, and I would say in many ways, misled in the sense that they are typical neurodevelopmental signs of traumatic exposure that that child may or may not have the capacity to, to manage on their own at this particular time. And so our work in trauma responsive schools in this is being a really good sleuth, having a deeper level of understanding about the physiological, physical, emotional manifestations of ongoing stress and trauma. And then last but not least is on the left, the future. So yes, we wanna think about how folks are gonna be resilient, how they're gonna weather ongoing difficulties given we're probably not going to remove them from those situations. But furthermore, we want them to um, further themselves, right? To transcend, to self-actualize, I guess, to take a Maslow kind of term, which I know has certainly had some fair scrutiny in the recent past, but suffice to say. Yeah, I think, yeah. I'm so sorry. I just like oh. always have questions for you. Please, best part of it. What in, in your um, circle of bubbles, I'm curious about your your bubble on the far right, which was the the curiosity, the gentle and persistent curiosity to understand somebody's story. And here's my question: your 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 um your five bubbles, what hexagon of bubbles, whatever you want to call it, mm. suggests that that's all there is to the story to to a person. And my question as follows. Are there unknown, like, let me just come out and say it, like, can I just be the way I am because that's the way I am? Yeah, part of my temperament. My I mean, temperament, temperament is variable, yeah. right? And, and the, the way in which I respond to my temperament and the way in other people respond to my temperament says a lot. Those are experiences. Okay, that was just what I was curious about what your thoughts are on that, because we we in in um, in the world of scholarship we like to tie things up in very neat tidy bundles, yeah. but we sometimes forget that there's other stuff that we that we don't know and that we don't necessarily need to know. It's just I am this way because of you know, whatever you want to call it, my soul, my spirit, my nothing. If I don't have, depending on one's belief system, I would say yes, and I I guess. Um... In some ways, as you've probably heard me talk about, I would take trauma out of this. It doesn't have to be trauma. 
Um, the fact that I've been to really good music shows or festivals and now I want to go again is an experience that had an impact, which you'll see in my behavior. That's not bad. Um, and again, it could be, right, Lisa, that the, the temperamental part is that you were born or neurodivergent you know, a kid with autism, we can put in that. You were born in the world with, with differences in the way that your brain processes information. And sometimes it was hard for people to understand you. Those are the experiences. And now you, whatever, are hesitant to be in a group of people or you get really, so, you know, I don't, it doesn't have to be trauma that we're putting there, but I think as a parent, as a human in the world, I'm trying to figure out what makes myself tick in terms of experiences. And I guess you could add into that, who am I as a person? But I think it really will manifest in interactions with other people in the way that I'm functioning in experiences, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, somebody said the other day that I said all kids with autism have trauma. And, and I'm certainly not indicating that in this discussion or any other times. I am saying that, as we talked about in the other sessions, there's great variability in, in susceptibility to experience. And, and what we may consider a, not a negative experience at all for somebody who's temperamentally sensitive may be what we define as, as lingering traumatic response. So a lot of variability in there and never a, a nice bow at the end, ever. <laughs> All right, should I go on? Dave, does that make sense to you too? Yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense. It's just kind of like uh, different personalities, different psychologies, different, you know, everything, uh, even um, physical stature. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, right. Influence. I can I can say from my background as uh, in pediatric physical therapy, you know, uh, working with kiddos with that never stood their perception of the world was completely different. And understanding the world was different. Yeah. Um, so, it, whatever your experiences are in your personality, and, and you well, can align. I'm working with a really amazing. I don't want to get too off tangent, but but you guys are working with this amazing doctoral level physical therapist right now, Dave. You were totally made made me think about this cool interaction. And he's a, also a trauma specialist from, from the PT end and an ANS dysregulation specialist. And he's trained in several trauma-informed PT approaches. Makes okay. me think of some of the stuff um, in terms of what you'd be capable of doing. And I guess where I would align that in some ways, and again, whether we call it trauma or not, I've learned that just like our brain holds on to those previous experiences mm -hmm. in fragmented ways that our body in its own defensive responding also holds on to, to some of those memories mm -hmm. in postures that, you know, later manifest as kind of chronic pain issues and, and other things. So mm -hmm. um, again, I know we're, we're a little moving forward, but, but in that sense, I think there's lots of different avenues to how our experiences are captured in our brains and our bodies. And no matter what, it's like, how does somebody figure that out enough? And again, you know, I could be born wicked, sensitive and irritable. And if I never interacted with somebody in the world, it might not matter. I mean, the, the rub comes that I'm around other people and that that makes those relationships challenging. That may or may not be true of me. Hi, Sarah. Hi, sorry I'm late. Today's like our first day with staff. So yeah, there's a lot going a lot. on. A lot of activity in the building, finally. It's been very quiet. <laughs> Remind me what building you're in. So I'm at Crescent Lake School in Wolfboro. Okay, well, I was at Crescent Lake. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Well, we are here for our third session. We are super small and mighty. Okay. Probably join us like, is this really a training? It really is. And we are being recorded, as you may have noticed. So we're still talking about trauma responsive schools. Yep. And Lisa had just asked me a question about the trauma responsive framework, which I just started to describe. And so I'm gonna jump back into that, you guys. And at any time as always, I'd much rather talk about things and have some discussion than just plow through my deck of slides that, that I have here. Share my screen again. I don't think that did it, unfortunately. Take two. <clears throat> So 
so I'm going to talk through each of these in a, in a just in just a moment. But but what we're really talking about here is is as you can see from from the the title, how do we integrate brains? How do we make connections that aren't there, given what we know about the the lack of neurodevelopment in particular regions um, post trauma or stress? And so again, I'll I'll go through these, but but brain integration, the wiring together is particularly important from the top and the bottom of the brain because it allows us to manage overwhelming impulses um, through cognitive mechanisms. Um, to build that, you need lots of opportunities where you feel safe in relationships and that people help you be curious, as we were talking about. Well, I've goodness sakes, I wonder why that that feels so cruddy or feels so good or whatever it is to you. And, and so top and bottom is certainly there. Left and right side integration, we've, we've identified previously, especially the Bruce Perry scans, where we see those bilateral cavities on either side of the corpus callosum indicating really no connectivity. And so left and right side integration is incredibly important. It allows us to put words and meanings to experiences, reactions, and emotions, which, as Dan Siegel would say, name it to tame it, allows the amygdala to calm. So the trauma responsive framework is a purposeful way to think about building those kinds of integration. And each of the five bubbles, as we talked about, is specific to, to trying to address one of these, one of these mechanisms. But in its essence, it is really just trying to pair previous experiences with the subsequent impacts, whatever those are, positive or negative. It could be post-traumatic growth impacts, um, but then looking toward resolution together. And, and I'll just put in a little caution here, especially educators, but also mental health are very quick to jump to problem solving and they want to skip all four bubbles and go to, and now we, here's all the things we're going to do to change who you are. And, and that is really more about, I'm here in the long haul, right? We're going to figure this out no matter what, and less about, although a piece of it is about the things we'll specifically do to help, help somebody heal. So this is uh, just a graphic from Dan Siegel to help us think what I was just talking about right now. So as you might recognize, the top bubble has to do with intrapersonal and interpersonal, um, me and we, as you'd say, right? So self-understanding, which allows us to understand other people at the end of the day, this up, upstairs and downstairs integration and left and right integration I mentioned. But then now I'm adding here, there's a piece of being able to make sense of our experiences by taking memories that are previously implicit or unknown or unconscious, if you will, and making explicit connections with them, the way they feel or happen in the moment or the experiences that underlie them. So when we talk about it, we're really thinking about these four primary integration ways that we're working toward whole brain integration. So first off, upstairs and downstairs brain, again, to borrow heavily from, from Dan Siegel. And so we're trying to handle these very active brain stems, as we've been talking about, is, you know, bottom up level of dysregulation. Dysreg we're trying to pair that with safety sufficiently enough that we build enough connection that people don't flip their lid. They don't go outside of the window of tolerance. And that is just like these repeated experiences with connection with someone else where you're distressed, you're upset, and we let you piggyback on our co-regulation. It's okay. I'm not going to get upset. You're safe. Those allow that integration to begin to happen again. And left and right. Well, no, if, if somebody, to the extent, when I used to do psychological evaluations, there were folks where this had been so prolonged that, that they didn't have this activity on the right and left sides of their brain that they, they can't even name an emotion, alexithymia, right? The inability to name an emotion. I feel upset. I don't know what it is, right? I, I don't even know why I'm upset or, or a physiological sensation. I came in the room and all of a sudden I'm completely upset and it came out of nowhere. I can't pin it to every, anything, right? 
it's a lot easier to stay calm if you're like, oh, I know where that's coming from. I always feel that way when I come into a room alone and there's a male or whatever, whatever the case may be. Doesn't make it go away all the way, but allows you to have something to kind of name and hang on to. This is the part that people get the most uneasy with and what we've typically um, either engage with as psychotherapists or we've avoided it in some kind of way. Um, but, but part of the primary things that happen as we've all been talking about during really upsetting, overwhelming, outside of the window of tolerance experiences is that memory begins to shift with the decreased focus in the prefrontal cortex. It's less facts are remembered as you see on the left, less about the, the narrative or story of my life. We start to lose, as we talked about, with state-dependent functioning, our kind of our sense of the passage of time. And it becomes much more driven by emotional tagging. They're like just sensation. It's things that have happened in the past and automatic responses, emotional, behavioral, otherwise, that, that come up. So perceptions, emotions, the kind of sensations that I have. And the, the research the literature, what we know from science at this point is that 95, at least 95% of our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis is completely implicit. And we can put implicit biases in that, stereotypes within that category, these shortcuts to get us safe in the world without having to do a lot of cognitive processing. So yes, when we think about the trauma responsive framework, we're trying to make those reactions and, and especially those connections with experiences, move them out of implicit where they're driving behavior and handle them much more through explicit awareness. And I'll give you some teacher examples of that, um, believe it or not, in a little bit. So implicit memories are those that we're not aware of, but they guide the way we feel about ourselves, other people in the world, vis-a-vis -vis the negative or positive cognitive triangle, often referred to as the internal working model. And if we want to think about a simple example of how this happens, you can think about a little kid understanding what hunger is. I mean, we all know what hangry is. Often it's not good when you're hungry. And if you couldn't figure that out, you might walk around the world being angry all the time. So like a little kiddo, though, doesn't know what the sensation of hunger is. It happens in the brainstem, but there's no left brain prefrontal cortex knowledge. There's a, a memory, an implicit sensory memory of what it feels like to be hungry. And then hopefully with lovely caretakers, uh, primary caregivers, somebody says to the kid, oh, my gosh, when they're hungry, I wonder if you're hungry. And then neurons that wire together, fire together right? Physiological sensation in my brainstem of hunger, probably with hangry, some um, um, limbic system connection with emotions that are associated with that. And then this cognitive awareness, this language awareness that that's called hungry. And later on, it doesn't happen the first time, like 10,000 warrings after so many people, eventually that sensation happens and I can intentionally go to the kitchen and get myself something to eat. This is no different when we're talking about experiences in our past that we'd like to have more control over. If we're gently thinking about those, then we can make those things explicit. So I'm gonna just give a quick little example here and I know I'm indulging a little, I probably should move us on, but I like this topic, obviously. Um, I could say to a kid, just think of this comparison, one thing is to label it and call it task avoidance. And we could even use an FBA to define all of the conditions that are antecedents or consequences to increase or decrease this behavior of task avoidance. And I, we can look at how effective that is at changing it and, and compare that with what if the student's understanding was when they're asked to do X task that it tickles or triggers, if you will, the negative cognitive triad and they feel worthless. And like they couldn't really do it if they tried anyway, because it's a hard cognitive task. So whenever they approach a hard task, they start to feel cruddy enough about themselves that they'll do anything to get out of it. I'm gonna tell you at the end of the day, that'll change their life. Cause that's gonna follow them into a employment when people aren't following them around, telling them to do their work. <laughs> 
right? So, so, so many of these things require me understanding what makes me tick so that I can make some choices to do something different. And having done 25 years of psychotherapy, I'm going to say it's much more helpful to have lots of partners and partners that work closely with me in situations that press me than just a therapist or just one person in an office all alone trying to help somebody come to this level of awareness. So what I've done now is I've just um, shared that graphic again um, for you so we can take a look at what it looks like. And I just wanted to add two elements um, as we're talking about it. What you'll notice on the very left-hand side, I put an arrow to indicate really the level of specificity about what we know about impacts and experiences. And that varies. There'll be some kids in a school, teachers are like, I know nothing about this kid, which I would encourage us to think about why we end up in that situation and how we can't know our families and our students better earlier on. But the trauma responsive framework will work even if you're vague. And I'll give an example of this. So we're thinking about how specific or how vague am I going to be? And what I would say is, if you know specifically what happened, then be specific. Don't be vague because it's hard to say out loud. So let's say, let me give an example that a kid um, just moved to your school in the middle of the year from the fourth foster placement. And then we say, seems like things have been a little rough. Probably not going to feel as satisfying from an amygdala perspective as, oh my gosh, I know you just had to move to another home and you've been a few this year, you've been in a few this year. Super nice to meet you and I'm going to be here to help you figure it out. Much different experience because I know it and everybody knows that that's the truth as does the child. We never want to in inadvertently pass on what's known but can't be spoken, which we do a lot as adults. That makes sense to people when I'm saying about bag. And on the bottom, you see time frame. Sometimes the things that drive our behavior are things that happened a long time ago. We don't ever have to talk about things that went, happened a long time ago if talking about the things in the moment work. <laughs> That's great. If it works, then, then we just stay right now. Um, I saw, oh my gosh, you got out of the car and you got up late and you missed your alarm today and you slammed the door because you're frustrated. Behavior changes, it's gone, we're done. But there's going to be other circumstances where it's that that it's that kid in foster care, and you know being late is just one more reminder of the things that have gone wrong, right? So sometimes there's connections between the past and what's happening in the present, and then sometimes people need our need our help to try to make some of those connections. But stay simple, and and be authentic and transparent about what we know. So I could just play with words a little bit. Like, let's just say we did know very specifically what happened. Um, and it's been a long historical thing. I've placed it in the quadrant that indicate, indicates specific and distant. You've had to live in lots of different homes. This is surprising you find it hard to trust people and you push them away. We'll figure this out if we keep trying. Would be an example of, of a framework I could say. What if it was like really vague though? I didn't even know. And it's been this whole history. You just know it's a mess. And I know working so much with schools that people are like, oh yes, right? Seems like things were rough for you when you were little. I see how upset you get. I know that we'll figure this out. I'm not going anywhere. And then sometimes things just happen, right? It could be like super specific. Oh, I saw how he talked to you and the reaction on your face. I could tell how sad and angry you were when you threw the chair. Not alone, these strong feelings won't last forever. So we're specific, it just happened. And then maybe it's like, we don't even know, but we're in the present. I don't know what happened before you came to class, but you must be pretty upset to slam the door like that. What can I do to help? Still making, just see the, still this gentle, persistent curiosity about the door slam. Last piece to this. I've mentioned several times throughout both sessions, we've kind of deconstructed this, if you will, that one of the criterion of post-traumatic stress disorder or complex trauma or you know, relational challenge is the negative cognitive triad. These three pieces around, I'm not worthy of love and belonging. On the left-hand side, other people can't be trusted. And if they're good to me, 
They're really going to hurt me. Don't let them in. Implicit, not explicit. And then last, the world is bad. Why hope when nothing that good ever turns out? So I just shared a smattering of things I've heard people say. My own kids or right or or kids we're working with or adults that that you recognize, oh, that's what that is, right? Worthlessness is I suck, I ruin everything. And oftentimes that's so uncomfortable for us as parents, teachers, mental health clinicians that we counter it very quickly. Oh, no, 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 no. Remember you did great on your math test last week. Oh, no, you're so good at riding your bike. <laughs> and it would be awesome if that worked. <laughs> it would be very amazing if it just made it all go away. But it usually doesn't. And I think now for all of us, and I've seen this play out, what a gift. I mean, this is like a little indicator, right? Like, here's what's inside. And it's a much different thing to say, well, no, you don't suck at all, which just counters the experience to say, oh my gosh, I had no idea you felt that way. Well, of course you don't want to do math. We'll stay with my example. Given the last couple of years, no wonder you think that. Now I've added the whole framework in it. I'm not going anywhere, right? I get it. You feel miserable writing this. Writing can be really hard. What do you need to get a fresh start? If somebody said, I hate doing this, right? Usually you hate it because it feels miserable. <laughs> I'll move us along in a moment. Somebody says to us, what do you know? You don't understand. We could defend or deflect or, or confront. Or you can say, you're right. I don't know what your life is like, but I'm open to learning. What would be more helpful? Somebody said to me in a training this week, unnamed school, a kid called me a racist last week. What am I supposed to say? And I said something very similar. I had just talked about this framework. So literally the first time I haven't looked at these in a while, so this is kind of fun. The very, this was probably six, seven years ago, I started doing this and I was with the school and the reading specialist was like, you're, you're a crazy woman, Cass. What are you talking about? And then it started my chain of getting emails from people. I said, send me an email. If this makes it worse, please send me an email and tell me to shut up because I shouldn't be telling people to do this. And on the flip side, if you do this and it works, please let me know. And I'd love to share it with others. So that's the vein. And this was my first quote that I got. And you'll recognize the elements first time. I just had to share that I tried using the statement that you gave us last time you were here. I see every time that there's something in your life bothering you, vague, right? You start to scribble and draw on the table. A couple of days after you left, I shared this with a student and the student immediately responded, immediately responded by writing, you're saying my family sucks on the table. I continued my work. The student continued to draw on the table. At the end of my group meeting, I asked her to remain and we talked. The student told me what was bothering her and then completed all of the work mix, missed. The next day, the student came in early to my room to be sure that the arrival time to group was the correct time. The student wanted to come and complete the work. Wow, really super powerful, you know, even single intervention where we're seeing a shift happen in the relationship. And as I move later today, I'll have some other examples where people are using variations of the trauma responsive framework, but, oh, Hi, everybody. I didn't even know you guys were there. It's good to see you guys. Um, but for example, this last week, the last month that I've been out with school districts as we're ramping up, I've been doing full days with folks and training them in a day how to use this. And the feedback's been really good. I asked the last district, I was with them three days, well, what should I do in Manchester this week? They're like, oh, you have to do the framework. I feel like there's something to walk away with when I'm really just in the situation and I'm having to have these you know, quick discussions or what do I do with this? Um, it isn't bow-like as Lisa would say, it's like there's variations. It's sometimes vague, people need to sit with it, but um, of anything, I guess you guys of wanting to be helpful to educators, it's the most effective and most powerful direct trauma intervention that I've used for relationships. Any questions or comments or thoughts? Normally, if I was presenting, I have a whole slog of slides about the myth that talking about things makes it worse. But I didn't do that with you guys because I think I'm preaching to the choir. But if there are any questions 
for you at any point in time from partners about why we're asking about experiences or the potentially re-traumatizing impacts of such. There's a, just a wealth of literature indicating that that is absolutely not the case. Okay. So for those of you who joined us later and who are um, just tuning in to what we're on, I wanted to, this is about trauma responsive school implementation. And I put it in three sections. I wanted to talk about this individual trauma responsive framework approach. And if people are interested toward the end, I can kind of share the worksheet and what we do with that in our, in our training sessions together. Then the next part is about conducting a learning community and thinking about why, what particular principles, in my humble opinion, are the most appropriate approach to both model trauma responsive practice in education, um, but also help people move the needle in their own schools. Um, and then last but not least, I'm gonna go through the five domains of implementation for trauma responsive school transformation with some district examples. Great. I will move us along. Then I will tell you if anybody, I don't even know how to skip edge, but for all of you, certainly, if anybody would like any additional information or further information about anything that I'm talking about today, Lisa with smile. I think I wrote a 150 page manual about all of this in tremendous detail with all of the documents and forms and the DOE now owns it. So we're going to say something. Yeah. You're muted. You okay. did double mute. No. No. Yeah, you're good. Now I'm unmuted. Um, Cassie's documents exist in our DOE toolkit on trauma responsive schools. So thank you. So they, they are there. And um, I think there are a couple of them that were too large of a file for me to pop in. But if anyone is looking for anything, I have them and I can send them to you. You know, in some ways, you guys, it reminds me a little of my dissertation, which sits behind me on a shelf years of work, hundreds of pages of detail. And you're like, will anybody ever look again? But that's okay, if you want it. In, and, and as you may have noticed, I, have, I never lack for detail. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, so GROW was the five-year New Hampshire Department of Education grant that I was fortunate enough to lead. The implementation really ended a, a year early in all candor. Uh, trickled off kind of at the very end, and I'm happy to talk more about what I see is the reason for the, for for that happening. And I think there was um, beautiful and amazing growth and change, and there were also lots of challenges to implementation that you know I've learned from, and and hopefully folks within that learning community also learned from. So I'm going to talk about the really the principles, the processes, and then the activities involved in implementation little bit drier sometimes than some of my other uh, trauma stuff, but important nonetheless. So much of what we talked to the first talked about the first couple of sessions had to do with the skills of being. So when we talked about social neuroscience or interpersonal neurobiology, and even when we're looking at the trauma responsive frameworks, those are very specific, you know, self awareness, emotional awareness, understanding, and really trying to equip people with those relational and interpersonal skills that they need. So that's the, the first hub. I'm also going to talk, as you can imagine, is reflective practice. And so when I say this, I'm talking about all iterations in the learning community. How do we help educators hold reflective practice at the forefront of, of their work with students as well? And then also, of course, you know, what are the, the core principles of trauma-informed care and what they look like in education? and borrowing heavily from what we understand about the way the brain has grown to learn through Cozzolino's work and lots of others to really think about key elements of learning or what they often refer to as tribal learning. And I'll talk more about that when we get to that piece. So those are really the guiding principles that, that I saw as ideal foundations if we were to um, exemplify in the project, a trauma-informed approach. 
So I talked a little bit about skills and being extensively in our other sessions. And now, as you might notice, I'm turning our attention a little bit to tribal learning and thinking about trauma-informed care. This is from Dan Siegel's work. And just very quickly talking about you know, the rapid pace with, with which evolution occurred and, and the brain occurred in particular, but eons and eons of time, we were really in social groups and, and caregiver situations that are dramatically different from the situation we're in now, at least in terms of the way that inner group within tribe, if you will, function, right? So smaller groups of people with banning together often to protect themselves or to conquer other small groups of people, but those tribal societies operated on very different principles, right? It's, now we're in an industrial society. When you think about it, it's like world connected, huge groups, even classrooms are bigger. The media explodes the size of the group we're typically dealing with, but our brain grew accustomed to working within smaller groups of people. And when you're working in very small groups of people, as you can imagine, it's hard to have the haves and the have not side by side without a lot of conflict. So cooperation becomes the guide. Whereas, especially in the US, we've really espoused individualism, pulling ourselves up by the bootstrap, which means that somebody's gonna step above somebody else, right? You have to have a, a dominance hierarchy through for somebody to rise through capitalism and, and this individualism notion, which means that equality and fairness aren't always tended to because somebody is going to have to take advantage to move up that. So then what happens is instead of kind of democratic decision-making about how we do the best to be the tribe we are, it becomes laws and rules and ways in which we impose and force those that are in situations that aren't equitable or fair, quite honestly. So instead of kind of cohesiveness making you strong, competition makes you strong. And instead of this equal sharing of responsibility and more importantly the equal valuing of each person's responsibility to the group becomes a, a vastly unequal division of labor and when we talked in the first session about our current context briefly i would say a lot of our current context is explained by some of the mismatch in the way we're functioning and the way we were set up to function and and for the sake of educators, gives you a lot of thought about how do I get into situations more often that are similar to what you see on the left than these larger groups that that don't necessarily build on how our brains were set up to learn. Cassie, can I ask a question about, um, can you go back to your, your, yeah. track, your previous yeah. slide? How did, how did Siegel come up with the terms tribal and industrial society? Because when I look when I look at the terminology, I'm thinking this he cannot possibly be late be relating this to um, anthropology because we know there are plenty of tribes in the world that don't have any of the characteristics other than yeah. groups of a tribal society. Yeah, I, I'm just curious about about the nomenclature in this. It's a good question and one I probably can't give sufficient answer to, but what I would tell you is there is involvement of like kind of cross-disciplinary in terms of evolutionary science and anthropology and and the latest neuroscience and, and you know, certainly variability within. One of my first things I would think, Lisa, is, I mean, we're thinking on scales in much larger time frames than what we see in our modern world, if you will, across variation and all those tribes, I think would be a fair thing to say. Um, and and I don't, I, I'm pro I know I'm much more ingrained in the social neuroscience element of that and much less knowledgeable and skilled in why tribal versus industrial was selected purposefully, other than to say he's not the only one of folks that are crossing disciplines that are adopting those kinds of terms to think about social structures. Okay, no, thank you because yeah. I'm, I'm obviously thinking of like Middle Eastern tribal cultures where there is no equality and fairness and there is no demo. I mean, it's not just Middle Eastern, but yeah, no, specifically that lot. comes to mind to me at this point in time. And, and just my caution is that we don't necessarily give judgment to something with the word tribal as positive I know yeah and, and, and I industrial think is negative you know that whole 
the dual yeah. the sort of dualism sneaks into it for me and I'm just had to say something sorry I love working with you I love the way your brain works and it keeps me thinking and and digging deeper as to why those are the you know kind of assumed terms and and ways of seeing things and people sometimes I've actually moved the word tribal because people have a reaction to that and I think we have some preconceived biases and stereotypes associated with it um yeah so point taken yeah and I think you know my takeaway for this is these large groups of classrooms or or communities where we're not thinking more carefully about things like democratic process and equality and cooperation are, are fair things for a teacher to be thinking about in terms of, or a school administrator to be thinking about in terms of how their school is run. Yeah. And, and I, you know, then just staying with that and, and staying with the terms. And, and again, we could see variability, but generally speaking, it wasn't in a situation where you had, um, a lot of individual people raising their children. And I can think of my own life living across the country from family. I, my, my kid's never been watched by a family member in my entire life and they're 15 years old, right? So typically in other places, or again, historically speaking, where we had more of a multi-generational or community-based approach to raising children's where there were higher caregiver ratios and we were less divided by things like cell phones, technology, not that those are bad, but often in the in the world of attachment as we've talked about those can take away from our attunement process so that's the book see <laughs> and so what are the elements then of and and i will say this too lisa and all one of my favorite books ever and one of my one of the educators that taught for 30 years teaches at colby sawyer now said this is like just an absolutely breakthrough book as a teacher to really think about how to apply this. Lots of specific examples about what this might look like. So a actual time together, like, you know, building relationships, hanging out, literally having time to be together. As we always talk about some level of, of predictability, routines, written schedules, all the things we know that are that are helpful but also in relationships, predictability and what I can expect people to do and respond like. I, I don't, I'm gonna be a little silly, you guys. I've been saying to people lately, don't build any more calm stations, okay? How about we just start doing that with the whole class because everybody in the classroom needs it and frankly, the teachers need it more than the kids. And so don't make a station. Let's just think about, how do we use, as we talked about the other sessions, dosing and spacing? We got to find a way to not have unrelented intensity around learning or relationships. And, and I think when we do what happens in my experience, and not that they're bad, but a calm down route indicates you're only going to go when you're dysregulated or you have a special ticket. And, and only a few have that. And again, we're so much more effective if we're doing it on with predictability and regularly through the day than if we're doing it in a need-based kind of case. So anyway, I would say thinking about building in regular stress reduction activities that are those bottom-up kind of activities, music, I would put in that as well. Um, clearly communicated sense of caring for each other. And we'll come back to this um, a little bit later, but we can't pretend that negative affect or meltdown is not, not gonna happen they happen. And so it would be a great idea for just to have a shared plan with everybody who might be involved in any kind of conflict or negative emotion about what will happen as a group if those things happen. What will we do? What will be the follow-up? So, and then I'm going to give some examples of the amazing implementation year we've had with Miss Kendra's program. Oh, so exciting. But um, an opportunity to share about ourselves, personal pieces about um, ourselves, and then some kind of team building activities. So again, what I was thinking about is if I can just put this lens on in terms of, of school transformation, I'm working with five, six, I lied, six different school districts and hundreds of people. And kind of like thinking about being in a whole district in many ways, how do you create this environment with that group of, of educators? How can we have enough time together? How do we you know, bring people across districts or buildings to have 
a shared sense of belonging and group and carve out enough time and busy schedules to know enough about each other to, to um, be reflective. I would do everything in learning communities and I know that you all are familiar with this, but the premise of a learning community is that we learn much more from the process of being together and from each other than we do independently or somebody who adopts an expert role. And I was doing my very best because I knew that educators really have the best sense of what their school needs to allow them and create the space for them to do that rather than you know providing everything in a didactic or a manualized format. So when we act, interact with each other, we trigger our brains to grow. Thus, we all participate in the shaping of each other's brains. And that goes back to what we talked about with interpersonal neurobiology. So just boring kind of definitions, but I thought fit well enough nonetheless. So we're really trying to have a shared agreement to move our skills and knowledge in this case around trauma-informed care. And, and hopefully people are you know, more aspirational and, and more goal-oriented and um, having really strong leadership around the capacity to do that. <clears throat> and I believe everything happens in parallel process, <laughs> right? That, that experiences that we have in our lives, but especially experiences we have in relationships trickle into the other relationships we have. And so this may mean nothing to other people, but it was really important to me that the way that GROW, Generating Resilience Outcomes and Wellness, unfolded, that the work we did was a model for anything those folks could do back at their schools to think about how you would create a learning community as a model of a classroom, et cetera. And then all of that would reach down to the intrapersonal level. Skipping that today. There were lots of struggles. Um, I'm being super honest with everybody, recorded or not. People really wanted a toolkit. And when you get to know me, I'm really not a toolkit kind of person. It's just so much more about reflecting and process. So the Behavioral Health Improvement Institute, which was the Center for Behavioral Health Innovation when I was with them, did the evaluation. And these there's some sharing from the qualitative evaluations to share how this what this learning community element meant to people. So I'll just, I'll just share, because of our learning community, I have become much more knowledgeable about what it means to be a trauma-informed system. In addition, the sharing of our learning community has provided me with more hope about our ability to support our most at-risk students typo. <laughs> I truly believe that we are finally mobilized in New Hampshire to affect change at a broader level. There's a sense of cohesiveness and being in this journey together. Little happy dance for Cass when I saw that. That's exactly what I would say you're trying. Where's this kind of cohesiveness and we're in this incredible journey together? A couple more reflections. It's providing us with a wealth of ideas moving forward to create a trauma-sensitive school. It is great to have other collaborators who are working toward the same goal. People like the community and wish they could have even more time in it. Yay! It's like the classroom, right? Same kind of thing. Um, I would like more face time with the community. It's an honor to be a part of it. Wish we had more time to be together. So definitely, right? You start to feel this level of engagement, a sense of belonging that really, again, exemplifies what we want in trauma-informed. I could talk literally. Um, some schools did full days on reflective practice and education. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we're thinking about what are our interventions and the, and the implications as an educator. We're trying to make much more informed choices. We're slowing down and being intentional about what we choose to do next. And then we're looking back and often about emotions and relationships and thinking about, okay, given what I did, how do I wanna do this in the future? And if you want, you can think of Shone's different levels of reflective practice, right? Uh, reflecting on action, reflecting for action, and then reflecting in action is kind of the, the epitome, the pinnacle, if you will, of our reflective capacity, holding all, all the mind and being able to intentionally respond. So I was hoping over our years of time, we're building this capacity to do this. It takes a lot of practice like mindfulness. Just a couple of reminders for us. 
I'm hoping the learning community creates these fertile ingredients to produce both neurogenesis, the, the production of new neurons, but also a rewiring of deeply held beliefs about the way in which students learn, the way in which we need to do discipline, et cetera. And I'm trying to keep people focused, not only on talking about adversities and challenges, but this you know, really central aspect of trauma responsive schools, which is capitalizing on post-traumatic growth. The, the reality that most people, us included, grow, grow in, in known ways as a result of resilience or uh, resilience in adversity, feeling like they're stronger, can handle anything, never, never knew they could make it through that, or, or closer appreciation for life or relationships, or making better meaning, having more spirituality, seeing new possibilities. And so it really is holding people toward this positive end of how do we create the conditions to pull people toward post-traumatic growth and not be stuck in the past or bound by symptoms. So I'm just going to pause for a sec. So we did the trauma responsive framework. I want to talk to you a little bit about what I saw were these primary philosophical guiding principles of, of moving in this way. And now I'm going to um, talk with you guys a little bit more specifically about the six principles of a trauma-informed approach. I'm sure you're familiar, but I would be remiss. That's kind of that last piece of it. And then we'll do the domains, the five buckets. Are there any questions, thoughts, comments um, about anything so far? Um, it's probably my, I'm sure it's a reflection of some of my own um, stuff, but in any event, implementation always seems really boring to me. So I'm probably self-monitoring and asking you to check in. It seems like there's just a, a lot of toolkit mechanics to it all. I get really excited when we can get to the quotes and the examples so you can see how it comes to life. But um, okay. So this is, as most of you will be familiar, this is um, from SAMHSA. These are the six guiding principles to a trauma-informed approach. And I'm going to just go through these each quickly. The way I've done it is first, I'm going to show you what we know to be a core feature of adversity, systemic oppression, um, any you know trauma, and then why the principle is one of those six core principles. And then a little a little bit of a, um, some examples. And, and some of those are drawn from a really nice article on caregiver engagement. Oops. So number one, the experience. Experiencing trauma leads to a pervasive sense of threat, which makes learning, connecting, and teaching more challenging. So premise number one, principle number one is safety. Um, and that you can think about all the climate work folks are doing. I mean, this just tells us why that is such incredible work from a brain perspective. The physical setting within the school, whether the community has a sense of belonging, whether people in their interactions are promoting psychological well-being. It's hard these days. I'm just contrasting for a moment and that this educators have really responded to this slide over the last month or so. Um, I think it's meaningful to think of this, this balance that we have right now around concerns with school shootings and then kind of active shooter drills with what that means for an overall sense of safety and, and security in the building and how we figure out to have a balance of, of those things, especially given the really, really low incident of school shooter incidents um, in, in terms of the overall picture of violence, or even the likelihood that a school will experience that. And we talked in other sessions not to be misled and not to forget these three other kinds of safety, you know, four forms of safety, physical, yes, and that's what my image was really um, addressing previously, but psychological safety has to do with the degree to which I feel empowered, that I have choice and voice, that 
it isn't about everything somebody wants me to be, but it's figuring out who I am and what my identity, what makes me do what I do. And social safety, do I belong? And in which you know groups do I belong? Do I feel worthy when I'm here? Worthy of relationships, worthy of being part of the community. And then the last form of safety, which you can think about um, a little bit of the tribal learning we were talking about has to do with, with moral safety. Do I feel like the environment I'm in is led by the le beliefs and values that I hold dear? And if we don't have that situation, then people experience moral distress. I know what I need to happen. I know what it should look like, but I can't do it. So trauma also has to do with systemic oppression and and a pervasive sense of mistrust for families and communities that have experienced trauma. Their experiences may have taught them that it's not safe to trust, that authority cannot be relied upon. And there are going to be potentially, right, multiple layers that this happens. What I feel like in an interpersonal relationship, what my family has experienced in terms of my relationship with the school or district, and then societal based. Um, distrust on real or perceived situations that have happened. And the antidote to that, if you will, in terms of principles is trustworthiness and transparency. When we are authentic, when we tell people why we're making the decisions that we're making, when we tell them why we're collecting the information that we're collecting, when everybody's held accountable and not just people at the bottom of the hierarchy. Those are the kinds of things that build somebody's sense of, of trustworthiness and, and transparency principle, principle number two. So decision-making about the school is shared with staff and families. There's accessible communication. All the languages are represented. <laughs> Not easy. There's two-way communication, lots of different mediums. And then as we talked about in a previous slide, conflict resolution. How do we handle when people disagree? Because as, as we all know, it's inevitable. And some people use like parent liaison or really adopt something like a more restorative approach to equalize power differences that are inherent. Number three, traumatic events cause a sense of isolation and helplessness. When your body is primed for threat, it's natural to feel judged and defensive. And one of our best protectors when we feel isolated and hopeless is to connect with other people that we identify with. So thinking about ways that we can have parent mutual support or peer mutual support. And hopefully everything I'm talking about right now what you're saying is, yes, this is already a part of what we're doing in our system transformation and, and able to align these now with how trauma-informed, how that's meeting the expectations and obligations of being trauma-informed or trauma-responsive. So what kind of programs do we have where people are having an opportunity to collaborate with each other, to talk about their experience, but also plan on what the environment would look like to, as you heard in some of the quotes, have a, a sense of hope and shared purpose. I'm gonna skip that for today, I think. Yeah. So um, as I shared with you earlier, we've been implementing Miss Kendra's program over the last year in seven different school or seven different classrooms element or kindergarten and first grade. And um, I have just have some quotes and examples. We do an evaluation of every lesson with every single teacher. So I have some of the quotes, qualitative quotes of, of the feedback that we've received from teachers. And this one again, really around this sense of, of belonging that I wanted to share. So the teacher says to us, the balance of respect, warmth, care, and listening to the children talk about big feelings was extremely apparent through the entire time of the lesson. Children seem to feel safe to express things that are happening at home with the group, listen to each other, make connections and nurture each other. After one child shared, another child moved her body over 
sat next to her and put her arm around her shoulders. This program is a great reinforcement to the social and emotional work we do in kindergarten. I'm doing this on purpose, like this piece of then a little bit of shared story and experience, normalizing of times of lack of safety is building a sense of empathy with kids. So this one says, my mom had three brothers and um, they died on Christmas Eve. One day when we were finishing reading Miss Kendra's list, says the teacher, this student asked, another student asked to add another item to Miss Kendra's list, the 10 things that shouldn't happen to kids. No child should have nightmares about people they love dying, directly in response to that student. It's so amazing, right? If the Miss Kendra counselor, the Miss Kendra counselor forgot to add this when reading Miss Kendra's list, if they did, the student would raise her hand to remind the counselor that particular student matter of factly. Don't forget this one. One day when the student was absent, the class was reciting Miss Kendra's list together. Several of her classmates spoke out to make sure that we included no child should have nightmares about people they love dying. Oh, utter beauty. Utter beauty that kids are able to do that for each other when we allow them in. Getting close on the principles. Trauma involves the negative use of power. School staff hold positions of power that can recreate systems of oppression, especially if not acknowledged. And so we focus on, as we talked about with tribal learning, collaboration and mutuality. That, that it's really when we share power, that when we make meaning together, that true change and transcendence begins to happen. And we have to give a little power away, right? To give other people power and empowerment. So collective and individual accountability of everyone is a top priority along with leveling power differences between staff and students and between school staff throughout all levels. And we can come back to something we've been talking about, especially Dr. Bruce Perry's work in this. It, that piece really comes back to social neuroscience. Any moment, to be honest, and, and again, there's a continuum, but our brain is asking, are we safe? Which means, am I vulnerable or am I dominant in many cases? Or in this case, do I belong? And there's so many of this is just built into, so much of this is just built into the way we interact naturally in so many ways and ways that we are socialized to do so. So things like if I have to look upward in my gaze or how big my, my stature or size is or how I use that positioning or what my status is, uh, calling kids by, having kids call adults by their last name, making you call me Dr. Yackley. Any of those things would be ways in which status can create power differentials that unfortunately and inadvertently can trigger this, this lack of trust response. So when we appraise something as very different, the power differential, then that is directly connected with our stress response and state-dependent functioning. Every time I have to testify for court and be in front of the judge, this is a great indication of what happens for me when this happens. I get really stressed out. And most of it isn't like I'm afraid that I know what to say. There's just often such a, an understood power differential that it makes us very, makes me very uncomfortable. Traumatic events, by definition, take away control over what happens to us. So we have to give control back. Empowerment, voice, and choice. How do we build that into really everything that we do? How do we recognize and value strengths? And last but not least, number six, families of color, immigrant and undocumented families, families with children living with developmental disabilities, and families who identify with the LGBTQ plus community have experienced disproportionate trauma, and adversity. So the last principle is tending to historical, cultural, and gender issues. We are trying to directly look at stereotypes and biases. We're trying to offer gender responsive services. We're trying to honor traditional cultural connections and approaches to healing. And we're not burying, we're recognizing and addressing historical and racial forms of trauma. 
know, does everybody get a chance to participate? Are we including accurate historical information, including that around systemic oppression? Are we valuing all sources of knowledge? And are we working as a staff to be an anti-racist school or to develop a level of cultural humility, become more aware of our implicit biases? I love the shares, can you tell? So this is cool. One of them is that nobody should be made fun of because of the color of their skin or their hair. And kids responded, as you can tell, kids of color in this as well. And I'll just try to share. Some of it was about gender. So this little girl on the far left is saying, someone told me because I was a girl, I could not play the game. It made me feel very sad. So that's a, sometimes it's a teacher, right? That's right. We can do one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes they just draw a picture. This is kindergarten, first grade. And then this little girl wrote, I like how I am beautiful. And then on the right hand side, it says, my baby brother said, you're not my skin color. Wow, right? Kindergarten and first grade. And they're already starting to have these discussions or sharing around this. And kids share, some of their letters get shared in front of the class. They elect to do that. I'll share that at the very end with you guys. Okay, we're moving along. So it is 319, we have about 40 minutes left, which is perfect. It'll give me a chance to go through the actual process and documents of implementation, but also to share with you the five domains and the district examples of those. I just wanna check in, any comments, questions, thoughts so far? Don't you love the little kid stuff, you guys, what they're doing with that? So amazing. Amazing. All right, I'll move this forward. As most of you know, my shared um, consultants here, well, it's a process and it takes a long time and it's hard to stay all the way through the whole process. So initially was envisioned as several phases as a five-year project, as I mentioned before. So the first phase is really like figuring out who was going to be on those teams, whether they were school level, district level, how big they were going to be, who the right people to have on those teams would be. Then it varied a lot school to school or district to district. And then we had to find an organized way at two different levels to help people self or to help people assess their growth or where they're at with trauma informed care. So a personal self assessment, but also an assessment of the district or the school and where, where that's at. And then we can engage simultaneously. I'll show you a graphic of this, beginning to provide the primary core concepts in, in trauma-informed care and to consult about initial activities to be adopted for system transformation. And all of that took like the first year at least, right, maybe a year and a half for us to get through all of them doing this process, coming up with their teams, working through the assessment processes together, and then beginning to set up the foundational trainings in their districts and to think about which activities, and I'll, and I'll show you those activities and, and examples of those as well. And then we'd meet annually where they'd reconduct the fidelity measure or the self-assessment meet quarterly with that whole large learning group for consultation and training together and, and mainly sharing activities, lessons learned. But then also meeting with myself as a consultant at the district level with their teams on a monthly basis to talk about how that was going and, and sometimes to consult on particular kids. And then during phase four, we'd adopt um, additional implementation activities, depending on the success in the initial selected ones. We do advanced levels of, of training um, during that period. And then annually, right, a reassessment, a new identified list of, of implementation activities. And then during the last phase, we never really got to this. People have kind of dropped off lots of different reasons, but the the way that it was envisioned with they would leave with a district sustainability plan about how to carry it forward and the toolkit. So the toolkit you already know exists. We did not get to a place that people develop sustainability plans. Mm -hmm. 
so we could a long slide i apologize for this but i was trying to give some concrete steps as you think about working through this this transition and trauma in particular right can be a loaded topic so first we've got to get enough commitment from administration etc and then begin to communicate with the board um, with caregivers about what we intend to do tried to have a good core team conquered they must have had I think what I imagine the learning community coming to, together for the six districts, I had in my mind, I guess, maybe like 30, 40 people. And I think our first meeting had 75. Our first annual meeting had 95. So really good engagement. People really wanted to be a part of it, but also in some cases too big to manage. So the, anyway, it was just interesting to figure out what, what was the right way to have those core teams and it depended on the size of the district. And then certainly, as always, they're kind of core champions that we're trying to figure out that are, are going to be the leaders in that group or any potential challengers in it. Hmm. So yes, we began to engage in self-assessment, but as you can see here, spent nearly the year working on building strengths and finding out what are people already doing in these domains, which I'll share with you, and how do we make sure that everybody gets input into what we choose to, to do as the implementation activities. And this made people crazy, FYI, because it was like, we don't have time to ask everybody. But as we just shared, getting voice, giving teachers, paras, everybody a chance to say, here's what I would imagine it would look like, goes a long way at the end of the day if they've had a chance to have some input on that. So it could take a long time in some districts. So then we incorporate that feedback. Many districts held a viewing of resilience, the documentary Resilience or Paper Tigers invited community partners to begin the discussion. And then, as I mentioned, we began what, what was envisioned to be at least eight hours of, of training for every single staff member. And then in the end, we ended up with different iterations of learning communities based on discipline. So we had a group of teachers that met for the whole year, one day a month for a full day, to work on teacher things. We had administrators that got across, got together as well across districts so they could work with like folks about what that would look like within their, within their role. So a lot on this graphic, but let me just take a moment to orient you to, to what I have here. As you can see up at the top are those same six core guiding principles that be, should be the overlay or the underpinnings, I guess, of, of any approach. You see the trauma responsive framework as my methodology interactionally, I guess. And then on the left-hand side, focusing on just this top now, is everybody's single journey, if you will, to becoming a trauma competent educator. And even on a team, there's a lot of variability. Some people have really no belief that this makes sense. And other people, it aligns perfectly with what they believe. And, and some people have a lot of awareness about trauma in this area, and some folks don't have any. So you're simultaneously trying to move individuals while you're also, again, looking at this entire system. How do we assess where we're at with regard to what it would be to be trauma responsive school? And, and then where do we go from here? And so there's tools for each of those, as you see, and the individual side, again, on the left, again, it's two things. It's like, what is my base of knowledge? And in that, I'm calling that the 20 core concepts. Um, and then also in terms of my attitudes and practices, what would an inventory of practices look like? So those are the individual tools around knowledge and practice. And then for the whole school or districts, um, it's based on the domains we're going to talk about next, but then there was an implementation ranking form so they could decide, yes, out of all these activities, here's the list of priority based on what we know in implementation science to be effective in moving the needle. And then a planning tool um, for how to, to address that. And again, and a, and a fidelity measure. So the fidelity measure happened at baseline and annually. And then on the very bottom, are what happened throughout implementation in, in these different tracks. And so they were a little bit independent. And I think this is true about the, a lot of the training I'm doing. Some piece, at, like I'm working at a huge agency right now, part of it is just training to all staff and these you know, predetermined modules that encompass the core concepts of trauma-informed. 
And sometimes that's a community of practices I talked about in later development. And then there were implementation teams and the way that which we got together and the subcommittee groups that got together, as I talked about just a moment ago, they were meeting simultaneously, groups of school psychologists across all those districts to look at trauma-informed IEPs meeting together. And then last but not least, they did pick, here's the activities we're going to focus on and see if we can move the needle, the five buckets or domains, which are on that far right-hand side that we'll turn our attention to in just a moment. So both of these are going on at the top. We're doing assessment at the bottom. We're really implementing. And there's multiple layers and iterations of groups of folks that are forming little learning communities, hopefully based on the principles that we outlined at the start of this. So just brief little visuals, the 20 core concepts. There was a self-assessment form that they could say, these are things that I really know all the way to, I could teach other people. The idea was to rate ourselves annually to see where I'm at and what my personal growth would be to move forward. For you all that are in the clinical world, I based it on the idea of the 12 core concepts for NCTSN for clinical concepts and thought it would make sense to try to um, in some way capture what, what am I asking folks to know? hard task. Okay, great. A lot of info. What do I really think is important for educators? And then as you can see from my initial title there, the information is really formulated about three of the buckets in the trauma responsive framework. Part of it is about understanding experiences. Some it's about understanding impacts and part of it is about understanding interventions and how we move forward. So again, the 20 core concepts just represents that core of knowledge that every staff member within those schools or districts would have. Then I mentioned to you the inventory of beliefs and practices. And so this is much more specific, not just about beliefs, but what they actually see themselves practicing. When interacting with students, I use observation and attentive listening more often than providing directives and imparting information, for example. I had groups, I could sit with folks. I mean, I did this a million times, right? We could easily go through this. It's a couple of pages and spend an hour and a half at a staff meeting um, or, a, or a team meeting. And I would have people complete it and then say, mark a couple that um, you think you're really good at, mark a couple that you'd like to grow in, and then mark a couple that you're not sure you agree with or you have questions about. And, and it was an easy, I think, rich hour, hour and a half discussion about where people are at. And it has, obviously, we're talking about this in a shared way. We're building belonging. We're getting to know each other better. And people are becoming more and more aware of what is it? What does it look like to be trauma-informed? Which it's, it's hard to get down to that sometimes. So as this was unfolding, <clears throat> we'll just pause. Hold on. I'm going to transition into our last section around domains of intervention. So I just, I, it was fast, all the processes. Any Thoughts, comments, questions about any of what I shared? Okay. Just a reminder, they are in our um, OSO toolkit on, on, on trauma. All of that. Everything I shared with you and how you would go about using it is all free and all provided there for you. And if, and if you get it from there, you guys, and you have any questions, you don't hesitate. Send me an email and just ask me what in the world I meant or if there's specific questions about a form, I'm certainly happy to, to make it useful if it's something you think you might want to use, okay? Okay. So now the domains of intervention. So however many years ago this all came to fruition, we were just really starting to look at multi-tiered systems of support before any of the DOE had really tackled that, any, uh, and schools were still kind of working with the IOD and begin to toy with this a little bit. But it made sense to think about a multi-tiered system and how there might be trauma-informed interventions at each of those levels in a way that were preventative around trauma, but also specialized or more focused ways we're in addressing it or a high end, you know, really individualized multi-system approaches. And so as you'll see on one axis, you're gonna have the three different levels. Oops. 
<clears throat> and then I did a lot of research. And this was again before some of the other to school toolkits came out. And like, what are all the different assessment tools and how have people described this? What would be the entire list of potential things? And are there ways to naturally group them into buckets? And so, yes. So I made five buckets of inter intervention. So this implementation activity grid is color coded green being the first um, domain relationship building and wellness. And as you can see there, tier one at the whole building strategy is light green. And then within the domain of relationship building and belonging, tier two is a little bit darker. Same domain, but it'll look different at level at tier two than it looks at tier one and so on and so forth. So we're organizing three tiers of intervention across five broad domains of activity. And in the at the end, there's 15 buckets that people could select or rank order. Where do we want to go? And, and I, people did like maybe two or three is all folks can tackle within a year. And some of them based on the self-assessment, they're able to say, done, I've already done those things. So let's work on, on this next, for example. So the five implementation buckets include number one, relationship building and wellness. Number two, overall classroom approaches. Number three, specialist interventions. And I put anybody who isn't a teacher, an administrator, or a paraeducator into the specialist category. School counselors, school-based social workers, some special ed case managers, sometimes school psychologists, OTs, PT, speech language, right? All of us other folks. And then family and community partnership. So how are we working with families within the trauma-informed frame or lens? And are we partnering with community mental health or, or other community partners to have a shared understanding and intervention? And then last but not least, we could certainly lead with this with school district leadership and what administrators would do to move the needle. So in some ways, buckets one and two are largely the domain of the teacher, if you will, and, and, and paras and the others address um, oftentimes administrators and other kinds of supportive staff in the school environment, but not exclusively. I mean, certainly teachers and family too. But. And I'm just, I really toyed with kind of how to put these in, but I didn't want to get to the end and not share with you. But what you'll notice here is kind of a, a blank sheet. So this was the activity inventory that all the districts spent time going, going back to their individual schools and completing. So given that implementation grid and all the things you can do, go back to your school and see what you're already doing within each of these buckets and come back. It was so powerful. And then what we did at our quarterly and our annual meetings is we had round tables where people could do quick roundabouts and share the activities and have a quick little handout about how that was going. So that schools who thought, yeah, I'd like to do that, could stop over and hear from somebody who was already doing that activity. Or if somebody asked me who's who's really covering this kind of activity, I could point them to somebody in, within a district that they could go to. It was super cool. It was one of my favorite parts of all of it. And so you'll see the same kind of um, grid set up. And then here's the follow-up to that. If you, once it got collected across school districts, and you can't see the reference now, but each of those numbers refers to the districts, which had a uh, key on the bottom, the districts who are doing those things. Like, it's amazing, right? This was from the get-go. These are all the things that people were already doing that we can include in trauma-informed. So we handed this out to everybody. But you can see once somebody's reading through this already, it's like, oh, that's a good idea. What's that about? Oh, that's how they did it. So it both provided structure, but also allowed for a lot of individualization and a lot of personal choice and selection for, for teachers and for schools. So once you come up with this whole list of what you're already doing, then the last piece would be to think about, okay, where are we at now that I know what we're already doing? So this is the implementation ranking form. And so what you can see is the five buckets listed along the left-hand side, and then the three tiers represented next to it. And if you glean some of the key factors from implementation science, as I'm sure you all are well aware, the level of need people's motivational level, how fe feasible it is, 
what the intended impact, or I should say potential impact might be, are all factors that you could look at each of those tiers and say, okay, do we really want to focus at the kind of all classroom level on relationships? Well, that's almost always a yes, let's be honest, right? But but maybe maybe where the school's at right now is that that it's all at the tier three level. They've got all these kids that are blowing out of there and and they want to know what do I do when a kid is flipping out or how do I do the trauma responsive framework? So maybe their focus is more those tier three kind of interventions. So as they sat down with a team and, and some people did this at the building level, some people did it at the grade level team and brought it together, really depended on, on the district. Then at the end, you go from one to 15. Okay, given my analysis of each of these factors, what are going to be from one to 15, the first chosen activities? And then they pick the first couple. And at baseline and annually, the evaluation team came up, and again, you'll have this, came up with a fidelity tool that measures each of those domains. So you'll, I'm not going to go through all of these, you'll recognize it's its um, 15 different pages because there's a page for each bucket. <laughs> and when you're moving the needle, likely for your follow-up, you're just doing those buckets or excuse me, those fidelity tools that represent the cell. So you can see this one is fidelity tool cell one. Tier one, relationship building and where, wellness. And so now they have a Likert scale to take a look at where that's at. And you can't see it, but on the right-hand side, they can give a score. And then we compare those year over year. And once you have your rank order, then we can go ahead and list only the ones that are pertinent, what those identified intervention domains are. And in Importantly, okay, which exact activities are you going to do to do that? And what are the next couple of steps we're going to follow up on? Then during those team meetings, we can follow up with them and say, okay, where are we at? Here was our intervention. Here were the steps. Where are we at? What do we need to do next with each of those? So not something for everything, right? Because we're only going to pick the buckets or the one of the 15 buckets or the number of 15 buckets that the school can really manage at that point, which isn't a ton. Less than I would have thought. Just a lot going on. So that's the implementation progress grid, the plan and mark progress. Okay, so bucket number one, domain number one, is relationship building and wellness. So first section is really around how do we build strong, resilient relationships across kind of all levels. Number two, often at the classroom level was social emotional learning. Ms. Kendra's would be an example, as you'll see, I'll put it in there of what you could do for a classroom level. And then I just mentioned for students at tier three, what it might look like for relationship building awareness is how do I deal with secondary burnout working with a student like that? Or how do I respond to really challenging aggressive or emotional behavior? And then bucket number two is really around wellness as a whole human and a whole body at the individual school, classroom, district level. And understanding that within the trauma lens, it means that yes, and, and to the DOE's point, yes, student wellness includes nutrition. But if we're talking trauma-informed, it also includes our ability to use reflective practice to help students transcend, to help learning, uh, facilitate learning. And at the tier three level, how do I deal with secondary exposure to tra trauma? Um, and so that's what that wellness would look like at the tier three level per se. And all this section is built on this idea that we can't just avoid fight or flight. There's real power in building the flock response. And, and flock, if we facilitate it, allows people to be safe and, and calm and, and to begin to engage. And they gave me permission, you guys, to share these. So I'll again, I just said I would share some district examples. So Concord School District, as you can see, chose relationship building at the tier one level as one of their primary interventions. And one of the things they decided to do was to produce these district-wide bulletins. And they went around and found out what different teachers were doing in the district to cultivate positive relationships. That's what you see in the pictures, actual pictures. And all the examples are what teachers were already doing. 
and you're kind of warming them up to to grow as the project um, as well. So I thought that was kind of a cool. I mean, you wouldn't have, but kind of a cool way to go about um, really tackling that that relational piece. And this is just page two of some of the examples that they did. There's a little bit of guidance, as you can see, about what is it to be trauma responsive, and then here's a whole bunch of different examples people can use to build those relationships. look at my time 343 I can't do it I'll see if we have time at the end I love this little video every opportunity counts it's on my YouTube page if people look but it just is a five minute little video that talks about shows the role of the bus driver and the person who's working in the food service and how every one of those little opportunities is a piece of it so great little video to warm up staff again I'm just a little worried about time um, we could come up with a whole list. I don't need to provide you this, but concrete examples. I cut I cut um, seventy percent of this slide deck out because it was really for moving schools in that direction. Often, I love handshake teacher trying to provide another older example of a way we can think about building um, relationships. You guys all seen that before the handshake teacher before. Mm -hmm. Reminding people it's really about moving away from seeing behavior, being overly focused on behavior and seeing people really focused on our ability to, to see people, all kids and what they've been through, certainly after COVID. It's about sharing control when possible. Right? These are the kind of the cores of what we talked about with, with trauma-informed relationship building. I share a quote from one of the school counselors, one of the earliest quotes that came on that I think I share this all the time with folks. And I'm like, don't let me give you all of the terms. Let's hear what people do that exemplifies it. I was part of the school counselor group yesterday. I want to thank you for all the work you're doing to support all adults and children and encouraging us to reflect on who we are as educators. I also wanted to share a moment I had with a student yesterday afternoon. This young man has several moments throughout the day where he'll shut down and act out verb verbally or physically. One day earlier this week, he flipped over a table because in his words, my brain won't accept that the size of a nickel is bigger than a dime. I.e., I have no idea why I'm upset, right? Yesterday, I caught, got called in because he's standing in the middle of the room, arms folded, refusing to move. He was told me something, somebody must have moved his water bottle and he didn't know where it was. So he was, couldn't go to gym. Every time I opened my mouth to provide a suggestion to move on, he'd either shout or show physical frustration. Then I thought about control. For him, he had lost control over something, right? Experiences explaining the current. So how can I give some back? I said, your body looks like you don't think I'm ready to listen. When you think I'm ready to listen, I'll be right here. I think he thought I'd finally lost it with the head tilt he gave me. Two minutes later, he came and sat next to me to tell me that he'd already lost two other things and he didn't want to lose another thing. I told him that, was, that, that he was right, that stinks. We sat for a minute and he said, okay, I'm ready. I love that, right? It might not work again, but in that moment, he had control and he knew I saw him. And then just thinking of kind of this building of community that, that we were sharing. Finally, you commented that sometimes you look behind you when people are looking for you to fix it, a comment I made. When you look behind you, you aren't alone. There are all the people you've heard and reframe their approach to adults and children. We are behind you beautiful sense of belonging and shared purpose that that we're all beginning to create in relationships that it's about um, eroding that negative cognitive triad reminding people that no matter what the most important important thing in that moment is to communicate you are worthwhile and wanted you're capable you're safe I'm not going to threaten you I'm going to be available I'm not going to reject you no matter what happens it's also about name it to tame it, putting words and meaning to calm down the amygdala. That's why we do the trauma responsive framework. But it's also about, as I often, we didn't hear, but talk extensively about trauma and misdiagnosis in youth. 
And so when we become trauma sensitive and adopt, adopt the trauma lens, it's about distress, not disorder. Of course, you're distressed in this moment or about that. Um, you're not necessarily dysfunctional or pathological or mentally ill or any of those other things. And in order to do that, as we talked about with the neurosequential model and very detailed discussions around neuro disrupted neurodevelopment, you have to recognize the signs and symptoms that we don't typically associate with traumatic exposure or the manifestation of traumatic exposure in children or young children. And it's about building a new path, right? And that we understand neurobiology and that in order to rewire neurons, it takes a lot of paths in the wood, woods, a lot of shared path around the kinds of relationships that we've been talking about in the last two sessions. I wanted to take a quick moment to share this with you. When I see things going on that seem trauma-informed, I can't keep it to myself. We have a second grader who has an intense history of trauma and an ACE score of at least six or seven. He came to us as a selective mute from his last school after just being reunified with mom at a homeless shelter. His foster mom was dangerous and they pulled the kids and did an early reunification. He does not trust and he does not ever feel safe, except with his teacher. She has created a relationship with him where she can be loving yet tough, nurturing, but still hold him accountable. This past few weeks, he's been falling apart because school is ending. This comes out as unprovoked physical lashing out at other students or just refusing to listen to directions. Then he'll just shut down and refuse to talk. He's so scared to lose this place this summer. He had an incident two days ago where he hurt another student. Yesterday, while serving a lunch in the office because of the previous day's aggression, he couldn't handle it and totally shut down refusing to talk or eat. When I went to tell his teacher that he would not be back right away, she ran to her desk and scratched out this note. She says sometimes she uses it to get him communicating again. When I brought it down, he actually smiled. Then he immediately began guessing the letters. He figured out the saying, I miss you, come back. A few minutes later, he was able to go back to class. And five minutes after that, I saw him at the teacher's table laughing with her and having a snack. She knew how to meet him where he was at. She knew how to be creative and flexible with him. She knew that he needed love and care more than being punished for mistakes. She knew he needed food, even when he couldn't let himself eat lunch at the expected time. This, to me, was trauma-informed teaching in action. Thanks for taking the time to read this. I'm just so proud of my coworkers in this place. That's it, right? How else would you describe what it means to have a trauma-informed relationship than this beautiful example by a teacher, which clearly I would not have ever come up with per se. I'm gonna go kind of quickly through wellness. Classroom approaches. Um, this is really so much of the beautiful work that you all are doing. It is those formalized um, SEL programs that we may build in. So on a whole class level, it may be things like considering differentiated instruction or the curriculum we're doing in SEL or brain-based educational approaches. I would put targeted groups, zones of regulation would fit in there. Ms. Kendra's could fit in there, though we often do that at the primary or whole class level. Psychoeducation or learning from books, and then the development of character strengths and virtues. And then at the tier three level, really thinking about the physical environment, about our instructional pro approach, or really very specialized trauma-informed interventions for those traumatized students. So Again, represented at all three levels for the classroom approaches. <laughs> a couple of examples of what we saw in terms of this developing competency and agency. Teacher saying about Ms. Kendris in, in this regard, the lessons allowed for them to speak up and learn things they could do if they found themselves in that situation again. The little guy says, one time I was told I was stupid but I went to play with my brother. <laughs> Some coping with loss, oops, wow. 
didn't mean to do that. I'm worried about my uncle and my auntie dying. This kid, I, did I say this already? I feel like I might've done this earlier with you guys. Lost three people in this year. I was worried about my uncle. I don't want him to die like auntie. Her heart did at work. And in terms of addressing gender and race, um, as we shared a little bit ago. And then student interventions, Manchester School District got an NCTSN grant. We'll be bringing trauma-informed groups to all those schools. But I think especially like Dave, if you guys here, how can we get into the schools for those folks that aren't and start doing things like CBITS, Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools. Looks a little like uh, TFCBT, but um, things like um, SAT, Supporting Students Exposed to Trauma can be delivered by teachers, Bounce Back can be delivered with teachers and a school-based mental health provider. Lyft is a, a small app, easy app for students to, to begin to work with some of this. And there's new applications around CBITS being developed that will work as a texting app for caregivers. There's also about 5 million other evidence-based practices, but in terms of kind of low-hanging fruit and where I think people are gonna be, be able to begin to implement, this is what I'm seeing most schools begin to, to bring in. For specialists, when we've been thinking about how to understand and create um, plans, often I was working with districts on the experience-based person-centered planning tool where we could methodically think through some of these reflective issues and some of the adaptive functioning issues that, that get in the way aka the trauma-informed behavior plan. And then at the tertiary level, specialists may be doing things like trauma-informed case planning, as I just mentioned, working with uh, crisis stabilization with folks like Dave at North, right? So however, we're beginning to work across to our systems and settings. Sometimes it's crisis supports, it's team coordination and meetings, it's evaluations that we're conducting. So at the tertiary, tertiary level, we moved to specialists. I just recognized right here. So specialists are trauma-informed IEPs and case planning. It's also about these kinds of crisis supports, getting kids into trauma-informed treatments within the, the mental health si system, for example. Going fast, I'm so worried about time. So are we making Referrals to all the beautiful upscaling of evidence-based practices, to name a two, two with the most broad implementation, TFC, CBT, or trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy, and then child-parent psychotherapy, or CPP, for the zero to six population. There's also, as you guys know, EMDR and MATCH and other evidence-based practices. But for peer trauma treatments, these are the, the most widely disseminated in every single Community Mental Health Center has capacity in these models, given you can get an intake and get in. <laughs> As you know, category four was family and community partnerships. So the family engagement work that you all are doing would fit within this, but also the collaborations on our multidisciplinary, or excuse me, multi-tiered system of support with folks like Dave that are here that are community mental health partnerships. So all of those would fit into how we're strengthening those relationships. And I hope that our role within this is that we're sharing what we know about trauma theory um, at, at really the, the core of that. So partnering with caregivers, thinking about how we collaborate with Child Protection and JJ, including things like school-based services or the referrals to, to EBPs in particular, um, doing things like wraparound supports or system of care, perhaps. Um, that's reversed. Um, partnering with local agencies for you know, students to get involved in learning opportunities in some kind of way, school efforts to increase uh, cultural humility, et cetera. I don't get to do this and it's one of my favorites, but we'll skip it for today. The caregiver example from, from a school. Last but not least, is school district leadership largely the work you're doing in climate? 
measuring and monitoring overall improving school climate and then discipline policies, but also, you know, taking the lead and actually believing in, in school change. I had a meeting once super quickly. We have three minutes, but I had a meeting once with all the principals and assistant principals and it was great and everybody was on board and we were moving forward. And one of the last comments from the superintendent was, all right, but everybody needs to know if we see any drop in scores, then, then we're gonna have to go another direction. And I'm like, we're done, we're done, right? So if it doesn't go well, I don't really believe in it. If it doesn't go well, I'm gonna blame you all. So good luck with this new initiative. So obviously like at the top, there has to be someone saying, yes, we believe in this. We understand what this might look like, et, et cetera. Here's an example of one of the schools having um, really tracked what they saw over the first year, uh, administrators tracking what they saw in terms of visits to the student support room. What's really cool that I love to share about this graphic is that they tracked why students were coming. And I want you to notice that the amount of times that the teacher sent, you can see line three, 20 is only 25% of the time. All the rest of the time that students are starting to, to use those are largely positively oriented, right? Teachers aren't sending kids, they're electing to go. And more importantly, in many of the cases, they can label or know what they needed, the function of, of the visit to those special rooms that, that they had. Oops, I'm gonna do this one. I was in attendance yesterday at your session. I wanted to let you know of how much an impact you've already had on me. You opened my eyes to a different way of tackling students who are referred to my office. My first question to every child or parent who walks through my office door is, what is it you need from me? Or I know you're trying to tell me something through your actions and reactions. How can I be of help in this situation? I'm certain there are others in my school who don't understand anything other than the child is just being naughty and that frustrates me. Anyway, your session really solidified in my mind. There's so much more that we can and should be doing. I've joined your army. So even administrators, right, beginning to see some of that shift. And so there's excellent, I'm sure you guys are familiar with guidance on policy recommendations around school climate. In the seminal document around discipline, they outline extensively what we know to do the prime conditions for learning, um, keeping students engaged, as well as what the primary recommendations are for trauma-informed discipline and how we begin to move the needle with that. And I can have, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but I'm happy to, to share that as well. I also often used to provide some kind of example, either a clip of resilience or paper tigers to see what this might look like in action because paper tigers is a specialized school. It's often hard for folks to identify. So I don't use it as often. And I more often use a little clip from, from resilience around Miss Kendra's to give an example of what that might look like. If you don't, I'm sure you all do, but hands down the best go-to on this is the national Child Traumatic Stress Network. Just one of a ton of amazing resources for teachers is the Child Trauma Toolkit. You can Google www.nctsn.com and give yourself some hours because there's a lot of great things. Talk about race in the classroom, talking about financial difficulties, all kinds of neat things for teachers to utilize. Cassie, I'm just being super sensitive of the time. I know. I Hold just on. don't, if somebody has to leave and they have a question, I just wanted to, just wanted to give Yeah, them go ahead. Yes, I right. I don't know if anyone does, but we're at the top. I have like four more. more. So if you have to drop off, you guys drop off. We'll obviously won't have a lot of time for question, but let me just, for the sake of this, Lisa, I didn't even look. I'm glad you said something. Let me just finish these last couple. So the Treatment and Services Adaptation Center is free. It's uh, what's coming through NCTSN and schools can get everything in terms of implementation tools and assessments through that, including the evidence-based trauma groups. ACEs in Education is a good resource often for really practical ideas about what people are doing. And I won't share for today, but suffice to say that our experience with Ms. Kendra is probably the most challenging and difficult student both in the process of doing Ms. Kendra's, but also in the classroom who had a one-on-one -on -one aide, was the very first student 
to get up and share their Miss Kendra's letter in front of the entire class. He can't even read and write. He worked so hard with somebody else to be able to get up and share um, what had happened with me and then shared with the class out loud. My dad got into a car accident. He abused me. He doesn't really come see me that much. My dad focuses mainly on my other siblings. And then this authenticity just met with incredible validation by, by the other students and how brave he is to talk about those things. And clearly a shift for the teacher and those other kids about where he was coming from. That's that. So thank you guys. I know I did run over a little bit um, and I'm sorry for that, but if you have any questions, if you need more resources, either they're available at the DOE for you or anyone else, and I'm always happy to, to respond. And I know we need to end. I, I have a moment. If there's any last questions, we can. I'm happy to answer those. It seems like there are no questions, but if there are any, if anyone thinks about it, they can, I'm sure everyone has your email, right, Cassie? Yeah. Can email you questions and yeah. um, a huge thank you to Cassie. I love every session I attend with you. A lot for today, you guys, right? But thinking about full implementation process in two hours is a lot. <laughs> and beautiful examples. Hopefully you guys, you got to see some of these just really cool as you're digging in with new places, like really cool transformative comments and know those are all percolating in the background for us. I love it when we get those indications of our meaning.